Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumo, and it's great to be on the show again, once again. Ah, well, I stumbled on this tribute book celebrating the life of Chief Dr. Ernest Shonekon, great man, was once Nigeria as well. You want to call him president, you want to call him transition chairman, but at a point in Nigeria's history, when there was a gap to be filled, he filled in that gap between the military, well, one military regime to another military regime, and then that led us into democracy later on. The famous transition government after the regime of Babangeda Ibrahim, Badamosi Babangeda. So I was going through his, I mean, he died, and then this is a tribute book. I was going through it, and you know, I was sad to see that he achieved so much great man, great things he achieved. And he occupied a very important office in Nigeria's history. Yet, no book to tell that story. And uh, this is something that has worried me for a long time. Nigerian leaders, we need to start writing, telling our stories. Um, I'm waiting for the story of General Yakubu Gowon version of the civil war for example where is it so many stories in our history our leaders have not been writing they need to start writing we need to start getting those books out and those books turned into movies and movies into all sorts of things that is how a country preserves history history is very important if you don't know your history you cannot chart the future so uh, i wish he had written a book. I'm sure he probably was writing one before he passed on. Maybe somebody has a manuscript out there. Get that manuscript out. Let's hear his version of that important story in Nigeria's history. Well, today is not about history. Today is about a novel, a fascinating novel written by a fascinating woman, Stella Osamo. She wrote a novel titled The Triumph of the Water Lily. That novel took Nigeria by storm in the late 1990s and became compulsory reading for those preparing for jam and wayek and so on and so forth. So we're going to feature this novel this week. We told you, we hinted you last week that you should look forward to watching Stella this week. Remember, we showed her reading last week and here we are today about to show you the interview we had with this very fascinating woman. Let's get to meet with her and then dive into the conversation with Stella Osama. Stella Osamo is an accomplished educator who worked in the United Kingdom's education system for over 30 years, influencing schools' improvement, curriculum development, and the understanding of African culture, people, and communities in UK schools. Her book, Triumph of the Water Lily, which was published in 1998, brought her into literary limelight. Stella Osamo, who spent over 30 years in Manchester, UK before moving to Nigeria, never lost touch of home while abroad, as she was able to use her writing to promote African culture. Her published books include Flavors of Africa, A Vegetarian Food Paradise, A Boy Samuel, Carrie's sweet encounter with the Bible, the Oracle of God, among others. Osamo has a degree in sociology and anthropology from the University of Benin and is a trained solicitor specializing in advanced criminal litigation, immigration law, and family law. She's a member of the British Law Society. Stella Osamo, nice to have you on Channel's Book Club. I'm delighted to be here. I'm very, very happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Look, um, I'm not into flattering people, but, okay. you know, learning about you over the decades, what mm -hmm. you've been able to do in terms of writing, your contributions to education in the UK, mm -hmm. um, curricular development, mm -hmm food, cuisine, African cuisine, <laughs> yeah. you know, your interest in African history. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you are really a fascinating person. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it, it's it's um, one of those things that um, you feel compelled 
to do for your, your generation, your race, your gender, and for your homeland. Um, I, I know for a fact that it's, it's critical that you just don't throw your hands up in the face of the kind of racism sometimes. You experience. You know, that yes, black people experience in the white world. I have the privilege or the opportunity uh, to be able to make a difference. And my opportunity came when I was asked to deliver a home office, British home office funded uh, project called Connecting Communities. And that uh, afforded me um, the opportunity to work um, in education at all levels, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. And when I began delivering the project, I discovered they put Nigerians in a special category, the mm. Ethnic Minority Achievement Service. And I asked them, I said, um, why have you put Nigerians in a special category? And I remembered I was being told that they just have a penchant not to be just satisfied with being just ordinary graduates, getting to tertiary uh, level of education, but every other Nigerian wants to be a PhD holder. A PhD holder? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you just love it? So why? Why? I remember the chief librarian uh, in Manchester. You know, I had an interview with her. I was supposed to last for 30 minutes, and it probably went on for 90 and an and a half. I said, I just find Nigerians. Um, fascinating. Why this love for education? Then I said, for us, it's uh, a vehicle for social migration, mm. you know, <laughs> for social, social uh, 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 migration that allows the child of a peasant farmer to become an ambassador that is representing Nigeria at the United Nations. And so I said, <laughs> the choice, you know, for especially women, African women is either prostitution or education. education. You know, you just go for it <laughs> with um, everything you've got in you. And then you, you just make the transition. It's, it's like a lifeline for us. Totally, <laughs> totally. And she said, oh, now I I get I, it. <laughs> yeah, I said, it's, it's either it or um, you, your fortunes won't change. Sink or swim. <laughs> totally, completely. Let, let's put that, let's put what you just said in context for viewers now. Yeah. You went to the UK in 1983. Yes. Um, you were in your 20s? Yes. Okay. And then you spent, you lived all your life there since. Much of my adult on, life. Until, yeah. until very recently. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. So you saw, you experienced racism, you experienced um, issues affecting ethnic minorities yes. and all that. And you did a lot of work to mm. try to get everybody to understand the way the world is supposed to be yeah, well, I mean, well, without, without those biases and those ethnic or racial um, biases. Uh, probably one thing I need to bring in here, and I think it's crucial, was that in um, the third year of um, a child's um, primary education in the UK, they have to read about the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. And Every child? Yes. And um, I found that the way it was taught was very emotionally um, devastating for black children because you're just coming as a young child on a cold winter's mon morning and you see n images of shackled, naked, totally naked African men and women staring you on the blackboard. And of course, the white children, the sneaker the giggle, but well, the f black children are kind of shocked and devastated. And some of them then began to ask us and ask parents, that is there nothing to our history other than the slave trade? Mm. And I, in my research, I said, no, the curriculum has to reflect that Africa's history didn't start with the slave, slave trade, trade any more than Jewish history started with the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I started saying to them, I said, we are in this thing together. We either swim together or we sing together, especially in Manchester where we were, where I was based you know, for quite a long time. 
because there was quite a lot of racial unrest. So eventually there was the realization that it was critical that they stopped lampooning African heritage and roots. You know, you go to the museum and what they present, because we challenge them at the British uh, Museum in Manchester, the University of Manchester Museum, which was part of the um, institutions I had to work with, that why are you putting dirty rags and raffia as African heritage? We have masks, we have evidence, computer evidence, that our history goes back to Nubian, that black men, if you go to the Valley of Kings, you see them, Negroid men with thick lips, broad nose, the Africans, they were people who ruled uh, uh, ancient Egypt. Yeah. They, they, and Egypt was the superpower of those days. Why don't you take our history back, back beyond? To, yes, back yes. To, that, to that time. Nobody says Jewish history started with the Holocaust. How can you say our history started with something that put us on the verge of annihilation, you know, and traumatized us, yeah. you know, emotionally? Why do you keep insisting that our history should start from? There, our history goes back. The only is the only of Ife. It's called yeah. the crocodile yeah. of Ife. And you evidence, you know, because if you look at the Bible, the Bible talks of Pharaoh as a crocodile. Do you the, of the, of the, there is evidence, historical, academic evidence that our history goes back to ancient Egyptian times. You know, that why make it seem as if all that there is to our history is a tragedy the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. You know. Now let's talk about your writing. Okay. Um, you've done quite a number of books. Okay, uh, yes. I'll, I'll, we're going to come back to some of those other books you've written, but mm -hmm. The Triumph of the Water Lily. Yes. Is it right to say this book is perhaps closest to your heart? Because <laughs> it, it was released in 1998, am I correct? Yes. 1998. Yes. yes. And it's sort of launched to your literary career, yeah, so to, to speak, speak. Yeah. right? Yes. So uh, what does that mean to you? It, it was um, a delightful book to write. And it was a book that I felt I needed to write at that time as a tribute to the Nigeria that had nurtured me. Because I came from a generation of Nigerians who um, in my state, my state used to be called Bendel State. Okay. And they used to pay you a stipend, you know, um, to, to go to university. <laughs> Back then. Can you imagine, you know? Excellent education and then on top of that, the paid you a stipend. So this was a Nigeria that I was indebted to. And I think the love for my nation is, is reflected in, 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 in Triumph of the Water Lily. And you also had a situation where there was a lot of a thrashy uh, literature coming out about Nigeria and um, lampooning. Uh, Painting the country in bad lights. Uh, totally. But it, 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 it wasn't the, 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 the motherland that I knew and loved. And so it, it, it was very difficult to find a publisher back there who was prepared to uh, publish it. And I remember a woman from Heinemann. Ghanaian, I won't mention her name for obvious reasons. Um, she was highly placed. And she said, I loved your book on the, on the QT. You're not going to get any of the book, any of the big publishing houses touching this thing with the badge book. Whoa. Because it is not sending, it's, it's, you're going against the tide. Mm. You know, like the salmon, you mm. know, that uh, when it's, it's the spawning season, it goes... She, she didn't believe in the book she, at all. No, 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 no. She did believe she in did. it. She loved it. Oh. But she said, why don't you go back home and see whether you can get the African Writers Series to publish it for you. But here, it's not saying what um, everybody... People, people uh, 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 and they're not talking about um, people being um, doused in petrol and burnt alive. And it, the gory things that... We normally uh, hear about the continent. None of it is in triumph of the water lily. So she said, but I'm telling you this on the cutie because you're, you're swimming against the tide, you know. And so I said, OK, but I'm not going to bastardize and I'm not going to be false to a country 
<laughs> that nurtured me, sent me to university and paid me a stipend on top of that. You know, and everybody, of course, everybody had tremendous respect for Bemidia in those days. And it, it was just um, a wonderful thing to be proud, to be a Nigerian. And that is what uh, is reflected in Triumph of Waterlily. This book was adopted yes. um, as essential reading, right? Yes. For Jamb yes. and and um, was why included? It was just Jamb. Yeah. It, it was Jamb, uh, but a lot of uh, College of Education and universities, you know, freshman courses, you know, are used to triumph over Walter Lilly, but particularly uh, the big um, use of the book in academic circles was um, for jam but somebody a lady has done a phd thesis on triumph of the water lily as well because she said for the first time um she um was looking at uh, a female protagonist um negotiating um how fortunes and that much of literature that comes out of the continent uh, makes women victims you know but that this protagonist was doing something unique, you know, she was negotiating her own uh, terms with her husband and so that she ended up uh, not being a victim of her circumstances, but had the capacity to be king and to be in control of her fortunes. And so she did a PhD thesis on, on Triumph of the Water Lily. Wow. Mm. Okay, uh, people are curious. Let's tell, let's summarize what this book is about. Mm. Um, without telling the entire story, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah, <laughs> people, yeah. people should be curious enough to want to read it. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. this is a story of love and hope. And, I mean, it's a story of many things. Yes. Um, yeah. It deals with so many dimensions of you know, um, human nature and totally. human character and life, mm -hmm. generally. Yeah. Yeah. But let's summarize the story. Mm -hmm. For somebody out there who is curious, mm -hmm. The Triumph of the Water Lily. What's the book about? The Triumph of the Water Lily, the um, hint and the clue um, of what the book is about lies in the title itself. It's about evolving coping mechanisms that allows a person not to be destroyed and to survive in the face of the threat of annihilation. You know, and invariably we find that the desert experience and the dark night of the soul invariably, sooner or later, comes to everybody. Because this book was extremely popular in a back town library in Cheshire, in England, because the issues it deals with are issues that have a commonality to people regardless of gender, regardless of race, and regardless of um, even age sometimes, you know. And so you have a situation whereby Triumph of the Water Lily, um, the education authorities uh, thought it was crucial for young people on the threshold of adulthood. Great, let's do a preview of the story itself now. We're not okay. gonna tell everything, okay? okay. So okay. let's do, a pre let's do um, the story in itself. Um, Ifwe, did I pronounce this right? Ifwa. Ifwa, Ifwa. Ifwa. Yeah. yeah, E double F U A. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a Ghanaian name. Yeah, Ifwa, the correspondent okay. uh, of a media organization Guardian comes to Nigeria. Yeah. Um, her friend, Nkem, yes. who is a central character yeah. of the book. Um, and then there is Norman, who is the sweetheart yeah. to Ifwa and all yeah. that. Yeah. Let's do a summary of that story mm. 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 without saying too much. Yeah. Uh, I want to get somebody out there in, intrigued enough. <laughs> Let's do a summary of that story uh, yeah. in a nutshell. Mm. And then I've got a few other issues mm. I, I would like to bring up with you mm -hmm. before, before we round up. Yeah. So the triumph of the water lily, yeah. the yeah. story. Yes. Yeah. So what it is, is that um, the protagonist in Kim 
uh, allows um, the reader to learn how to cope with the nastiness that is often and stigma that goes with being childless, childless. Yeah. Or, or, or being uh, tagged barren and to come out of it um, not a victim but a victor and um, Norman is a pathfinder guide, you know, to you, most young men out there, you know, in terms of how to be a proper man. And she and didn't then, fancy him initially. Yes, yeah, she didn't. <laughs> she didn't give him a chance initially. Well, he persisted uh, and he got um, like what he wanted. Like women do to us a well, lot of times. And, yeah. But then, uh, but, <laughs> but then, um, Efo herself too um, is, is, is a role model for most young women and... Um, uh, she is inspiring in terms of um, showing young women how to command the respect. I like the way you writers talk about your characters, like, you know, like just some guy or some lady, far, far off. And, but you created them. The, I, 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 that amazes me about, you know, writing, yeah. about writers. Mm. The power to create a world, yes. to create situations and mm. circumstances and characters. Some writers tell me that once they've done the initial creation, mm -hmm. the character takes a life totally. of its own. Is that, is that true? I was just about to Did say that. that. I was just, and sometimes the characters begin to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, really? totally, you know. <laughs> and you, you know what, to, um, you know what Norman would say, as opposed to what um, if was housekeeper, you know. Uh, would say, you know, you, you, the characters are so, they are totally different. They're totally different. But if you, you, you've done your job properly, after some time, they actually begin to talk to you. And when you've finished, you miss them, you know? You miss them terribly. <laughs> and then another thing is, is that I write in the first person narrative, you know, so that um, I find that um, that is a writing style that is successful for me. And so I throw myself, I throw myself into the characters. Uh, but having said so, after a time, they take on a life of their own. They take on a life of their own. And I, I enjoy, hmm. I enjoy. What doing. does this book uh, mean to you? I mean, this is a book released in 1998. Mm. Here you are mm. on TV. 30 years down 2022, the talking mm. about it. Yeah. It's, it's about, what time Dr. Collatis said in his foreword, he wrote a very powerful foreword to Banff of the Water Lily. Um, it's, it's about a Nigeria that fills you with nostalgia, a Nigeria of yesteryears that one misses terribly, a Nigeria that was much loved, and a Nigeria that can be resurrected, you know, and a Nigeria that challenges the fourth state of the realm to begin to give our people a vision, a hope, because the Bible says it without vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if you've lived in places like Britain, where you see that their society and their national character is not accidental. And so Triumph of the Water Lily is one of those um, books that says our people need a vision, a vision of hope, a vision that things can change, and a vision that we, we, we are amazing people with great capacity for hope, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it, it's some kind of, I think it's a God-given thing. Mm. Well, this is not the only book you've written. Um, you've done so many other books. Yes. Um, you've, ri you've written quite a few books for children. Yes. And um, one of your passion is also um, African cuisine. Yes. Um, tracing back um, in history. Yes. Some of, some of the women yeah. way back slave trade history yeah. and what they brought into Western yeah. Europe and so on totally. in terms of food, food um, types. Mm. Uh, how is that for you? Um, you are a passionate, prolific writer, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, as far as the children's book is, is concerned, um, I'll just make mention of a particular book called uh, Carrie. Um, Carrie's Encounter with the Bible, the Oracles of God. This book had tremendous appeal and it, uh, it talks of the burning love of God for humanity. And I, I, I wrote it because 
all of my growing years, and people in my generation I mean, will affirm this as well, I never saw any black angel or any heavenly being that was black, you know, <laughs> in all my Bible stories. And I remember... That's true. Yes. And then one Christmas, uh, the Royal Mail just came out with stunningly beautiful, you know, black angels, you know, Christmas stamps. You know, the black angels. And I said, yes, the next time I write a book for children, I'm going to put beautiful black angels. Black angels. <laughs> and so this, 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 well, it's there on um, Okada. It's called uh, Carrie, Carrie's Encounter with the Bible, the Oracles of God. Wow. It's been a pleasure um, having you here on the show and um, Thank you very discussing much. with you. Um, the Triumph of the Water Lily. Mm -hmm. Nice book. Thank well you. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very Great much. Great to have you on Channel's Book Club. Thanks for joining us. I'm delighted you've invited me. Thank you so much, Kobe. Thank, Thank you. And this is where we have to end the show today. Please send us your comments, your questions, your feedback, your criticisms, everything. Send, it, send them to us through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. We're always excited to hear from you and we always try our best to respond to your inquiries. My name is Ola Kunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.